uh, title of the talk today is something about um, classical and traditional Dharma, right? Reimagined, right? So, um, classical Dharma, which uh, we're doing here, means we want to have the same experience uh, the Buddha had. We want to be Buddhas. That's that's what we're saying in these uh, narrative meditations that sometimes are called prayers. <clears throat> We shouldn't have to say anything after we're doing, um, you know, refuge and bodhicitta, mandala offering, heart sutra. That should be it, right? We just okay. Let's just meditate. <laughs> that should be should be enough. But generally, people want a little bit more. You know, Dharma talks uh, in America um, are topical, right? People like that a lot. They look like oh, okay, you know, we're talking about current things we're going through. Um, where traditional Dharma talks usually are not in, in Asia, they're not topical at all, and they have no jokes. So <laughs> when, when I invited uh, Chodhan Rupshe here uh, many years ago, um, I came a number of times, I said, give a talk specifically on heart sutra. <clears throat> So we did. There were no jokes. There was no topical references to like what we're going through as practitioners. That's just here's the truth. I should mention one of the reasons I invited him is because there was a, a kind of an informal argument debate going on, like what's the right mantra? Because in Sergei tradition, we go Taita, Gati Gati. We we don't have the Om, you know. So some people say, we're Lama, you're missing the om. We need to change the text. Um, so, uh, but I didn't. But eventually, you know, uh, he finally said, you know, it doesn't matter which one you do when you're home. <laughs> well, well, we'll just do it this way so we don't confuse it, but you can do it either way. So, um, you know, Jen's going to be talking a little bit about the Heart Sutra next Sunday, right? Um, we're going over that in a lot of detail, giving more scholarly. But um, so just so you know, like, if you go home and you want to go Om Gate Gate, like they do in many services and centers, uh, that's okay. You won't be kicked out. So um, I want to point that out, that classical Dharma, even though we're... Um, uh, you know, following the way of the Buddha, there, there are different ways to do things, right? You know, when you'd read the Dalai Lama's works, he's always saying, well, if you take it from this, you know, Madhyamaka perspective, this is what that says, and Yogacara, and this teacher said this. So, um, you know, we we have we have some variety. You know, we're we're still um, we're in the family, even though we may have some slight different ways of doing stuff. That's classical, because if pass, paths are authentic, different paths um, um, can lead to the summit of the same mountain, right? It's just generally, though, you want to be on the same mountain, okay? So our mountain, of course, is um, bodhicitta. That's the mountain we're climbing. So developing the motivation uh, to be Buddha, to be awake in order to benefit all beings liberate them in the best way possible. <clears throat> so that's very classical. So tradition is like uh, all around you. These are tankas, which are very traditional, right? <clears throat> um, but on the service and bows and robes and the religious side. Um, so we're, we're somewhat traditional. Um, we're traditional enough so that when um, our family of teachers come from very traditional backgrounds, they can go, oh, okay, these people, um, this feels kind of at home. I, I know what I know what's going on here. This is familiar. The altar is familiar. The way we kind of do things is familiar. So there's 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 enough tradition here that it doesn't look like we've lost our minds from, from that point of view, right? But um, there are no chairs. At Sarah J. Okay. This is totally this style where we're sitting in chairs. No, you don't find just rows and rows of cushions, right? There are no chairs. 
don't go there if you're expecting a chair in any, you know, traditional monastery or temple, no chairs, right? So generally, um, men and women aren't sitting together. So, so we're not traditional that way. We get chairs, we, we have um, some kind of uh, gender acceptance and equality, however we define that on a given day. Um, what else is different? We have questions and answers. We, we have discussion afterwards. In a traditional, really traditional Tibetan or Japanese or Vietnamese, there's no questions. You don't get to raise your hand. <laughs> like, later, maybe you in private, but no, no questions. So I've brought this up many times. We do a lot of different things that that actually aren't traditional. Um, part, um, but we do enough tradition that we're we're carrying on things that I think are are important and um, allow uh, uh, you know Asi Asian style, uh, you know, very traditional style to still relate with what we're doing. It's not that weird. It's a little bit di very different to have a Tara Madonna shrine room. I should point that out. That's that's really different. But it's still like she's green and she looks like Tara, don't you think? So <laughs> we have a Tara Madonna surrounded by very very traditional tankas. So that's that's kind of relatable. So we're we're extremely classical in the sense I'm not trying to invent a new form of enlightenment or Buddhahood. But um, and we're traditional in in a relatable way, but many things we don't do. So, well, we're doing this. We're doing everything in English, right? Or, though sometimes when our teachers come, it's nice to do things in Tibetan, and um, it's nice to know a little Tibetan. So, um, <clears throat> but uh, we're very progressive to the next step, and in other ways. Uh, what's very progressive here, Lions Roar, is, uh, well, in the morning we do a recovery group. You're not going to find uh, an addiction recovery group <laughs> at, a, at a, a monastery temple. I don't think so. Maybe that's changed, because I haven't uh, been back in Asia recently. It may not change. We um, have various classes that you wouldn't find. We have little Buddhas. We have uh, a kindergarten. Uh, we have a garden right there that's safe for kids. Want to make it even safer. <clears throat> Our little Buddhas program. We have art. We have had art shows. And um, it's been a while, but um, when the Wadsworths were here, we had a DJ dance, which I want to have again, by the way. You would never have that. That would you'd never have that. <laughs> we have Expressions, which is a community-wide uh, celebration, I would say, of community and love. Um, uh, I'm interested in having um, a Spanish-speaking you know, service entirely. Uh, we're working on that. So um, we're going to eventually have like a uh, band shell outside so we can have uh, events outside and invite the whole community. This is so, so progressive, right? What else, what else is progressive? We can out, we, you can be thinking about it when we have a discussion. So we're very classical. We're halfway traditional and um, we're actually uh, very progressive like that. So that, that for me is the um, kind of style. For me, I, li I like building the traditional and the classical, and I like building the um, progressive side on both the classic and traditional, because then um, uh, maybe I'm saying this a little defensively, but when I'm, when I'm challenged on it, then I can go back to the traditional and classical, and I say, well, this is why we're doing this. That helps to have that scholarship, like, so I say to my students here, um, I, I know how to do it really traditionally. And 
um, traditional teachers come here, like, know that I know how to do it traditionally, absolutely, but that doesn't mean I'm going to do it. But at least when I kind of break the rules, <laughs> I know I'm doing it. So it's not just like we're in America, so you know we're going to do it American way, which is a silly idea. Um, <clears throat> the big progressive piece that um, uh, I want the temple to be much more reflective of the whole Sacramento and California community. You know, um, I, I've said it a bunch of times, and it's uh, sounds weird, it, but um, it it cannot just be uh, a group of nice white people. We can't have it. I, that will be a failure for me, right? Um, I like nice white people. I'm a nice white person mostly, when you know, mostly. Um, I can't stop that. You know, I came from a wealthy family on the East Coast, and you know, all that, all that goes with privilege. Um, but uh, I, I know that that can't be. That's not. That's not where we want to end. It can't be Dharma Club. So um, we have to expand, um, you know, beyond that. Um, one of the factors that I bring with it, you know, is um, I'm going to bring a lot of my therapy and substance abuse background into Dharma things. Um, I, I like it, you know, um, you know that that social worker chaplaincy side of things is very progressive. Also, um, uh, talking to traditional teachers, even going back to Jada Rinpoche. Um, who, who has ordained chaplains, which is a total breakthrough, a total new thing. We, you know, sitting around with him and Geshe Tashi and goes, what's a chaplain? Took a long time to explain. I'm not sure he totally got it. He went, well, okay, it sounds like a good thing. We'll do it. You know, I go, thank you, thank you. But <laughs> they're still getting like, I don't get it. You're not, you're not llamas. You're not, you know, chaplain. What is that? You know, they're still working on that. That's, that's totally progressive from Tibetan point of view. Do you realize that? It's not, you know, it's totally progressive. They're going, chaplain, chaplain. What's the Tibetan word for that? And then you go back and forth, back and forth. I don't think I came up with one, right? You know, just like, there's nothing comparable to kindergarten. There's, there's no, kids just do exactly what the parents are doing, you know, kind of, there's no kind of like we're, you know, having a kindergarten movement you know, like they did in Germany. Like, there's a special way that kids learn developmentally, you know. There's there's no mental, there's no mental health thing. Uh, there used to be at Sarah J a little, you know, maybe it's changed. There's, um, you know, little dispensaries, right? They're little, um, uh, maybe little kind of clinic things. But when I was there, like, I, don't, I didn't, and frankly, I didn't get as much practice done uh, that I wanted to, um, because people would come in and to go, I hear you're a psychiatrist. And they go, no, no, I'm a psychotherapist. They don't, that means nothing. So can I talk to you about my family? You know, like that. Because you couldn't, couldn't do it. You couldn't do it in a monastic, there's nothing. Well, you've left your family, so there's nothing else to say. But everyone loves their family, even, you know, even when you kind of don't like them. So, so you know, people would go, well, what? what? <laughs> so, yeah, Elizabeth is my um, student that holds up the flower and laughs. Thank you. So, um, yeah, you know, so people come to me, well, you know, I've got this problem. What do I do? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, you know, like, here's what I think you got to do. But that it's totally, it's totally neat to do, um, to have a training in psychotherapy or psychology or, and, and doing Dharma. There's only one other teacher I know that has that kind of training, Lama Paldin, who I think is um, in Portugal now. So um, the Zen, a Zen person um, uh, is an LMFT in uh, L LA, John Book Bazan, who's super nice. It helps, right? Because most of the time we just have regular family problems, right? You know, we, we, we're not like, you know, talking about like what's emptiness or enlightenment when, you know, our kid steals the car or, you know, a family member won't talk to us. And, you know, it's, it's basic. So we're very progressive in all these different ways. And um, 
we could be more, but the basic model is we have to be uh, more open if possible to, um, to be identified as like uh, a community and cultural center, not just um, a Buddhist temple like that. This was, I'm not making this up. This was my teacher's vision who was very adamant. He just said, well, I don't want any, I don't say, let's, let's make a Dharma sound. And he goes, no, I don't like Dharma sound. And, and he didn't know what that term meant. You know, I just, he says, I don't want monastery. And I know, he says, let's just meet in people's houses. We'll just rotate like, like that. Because the idea was to get out into the community, right? Get, you know, do, do as much as possible, not, not to try to centralize. We do need some centralization to sponsor events, to do teachings and so forth. But uh, if we have that, we have to bring people here that normally wouldn't kind of, you know, be saying, you know, what, what does this have to say to me? Right? So that's, that's very progressive to be involved in social justice things or be community involved is um, the progressive side what we're doing. But at the same time, uh, I can point to very traditional and very classical references to say, you know, the Buddha was involved in social justice issues, really was very critical of the caste system, was revolutionary, and many uh, along the line, you know, uh, the formation of hospitals and, the, the you know, uh, rights work has been very strong in, in the Asian countries particularly in the last hundred years. So um, we're not leaving classical or traditional world when we say, yes, we, we want to have people come here and um, participate in artistic and musical events. We want people to come and um, hear about recovery and mental health events. We want people to come and, and just picnic and you know, listen to somebody reading poetry outside. That That is totally okay. And we can, um, you know, we're not as a nonprofit supposed to support um, political parties, um, but, you know, that doesn't, uh, but, you know, we get to have stands on things, right? A lot of times people think, oh, we, you know, we're just silent and no, we can, we can say things. That doesn't mean you're going to lose your 501c3, you know. Um, we can take stands, like people go, well, we can't take any stands. Well, um, how about we just take a stand against child abuse? <laughs> you know, that, there's, there's no possible, is there any possible argument, right? Let's stand up for kids, right? Is there any possibility that could be wrong? Well, we're not supposed to wade into things. No, you 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 do. You stand up for kids. I mean, you stand up for you know um, marginalized groups. You know, um, no, we can do that. That's not political. You know, like that suffering is not a political problem. It's a universal problem, right? So like that. So uh, that's my talk for today. <laughs> <laughs> the, it, it's not it's not really that much fun if everybody agrees with what I said, but um, from a personal level, I do want everyone to agree. <laughs> like, I just want everyone to be liked. I mean, I like me, and li I want to like you, and we're all Sally Fields inside, aren't we? You know, but um, I'm happy to have like a, a discussion or input, you know, and Patty can run around with the uh, um, microphone and it's very complicated you have to teach people how to push the right button at the bottom this... don't touch it okay good we 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 do have the the virtual let's go hi llama uh this is dirk was invited to unmute. So, um, regarding the English texts versus practicing in Tibetan, I think we're just doing what the Tibetans did. They are they translated everything in Tibetan. In fact, there are yeah, texts that are me. only in Tibetan. Uh, you can't hear me. <clears throat> oh. uh, there are only uh, 
there are texts that are only in Tibetan now that we have that they translated in Tibetan. They didn't even keep the Sanskrit but text. Is there a way for him to know that we can't hear him? Oh. Uh, oh okay. Um, <laughs> we need some semaphore flags or something. Can you hear me now? <laughs> can no, hear still not. You? Can you hear me now? He's uh, trying to correct it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I still. I'm sorry. I'm doing everything I can. Can anybody online hear me? <clears throat> yes. Let's go for that. Yes. I think the people in the studio can, I mean, online can hear yeah. me. Should we not issues? Can you speak again, Dirk? Can you hear me now? We can hear you only through our main computer, not through our sound system, which uh -huh. is weird. Okay. Uh, maybe I should just shut up then. I could just no. type my comment. I see technical issues as opportunities to practice patience. Um, but maybe while they're working on it, maybe Ellen could ask that question while, while they're working on it. How's that? Because we have limited time. OK, it should be green. Push the bottom. OK. Now? I'm only. Oh, I hear myself twice. How I know, I'm sorry, guys. Can you hear me, Lama? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. So, yeah. Um, I appreciate the breadth of everything you bring to uh, Lions Road Dharma Center. And what I notice is in doing so, you don't compromise. You know, it's not like we have watered down. Um, traditional and watered down contemporary. I mean, it's it's like the real deal on both ends. How, I, I mean, it seems like the risk is that there can be an experience of overwhelm with so much breadth and so many different things going on. How do either we as students or as organizers or you as a teacher, you know, have us not feel that sense of overwhelm? Okay, that's a good question. Um, it, it depends upon, the, my answer has to depend upon what level of, um, what vehicle we're using uh, and what um, style of practitioner we're talking about. Because of course on the Himyana view is do no harm and let go. So we're, we're trying to be you know, very precise and not overwhelm anybody, right? And then from Mahayana point of view, slightly different point of view, we're trying to uh, have uh, someone become more expansive because we're talking about uh, universal love and compassion and, and spacious emptiness, right? Um, but once we get to Vajrayana, of course, the point is to overwhelm people um, in, a, um, in a skillful way, right? Um, because uh, without... Without that, um, we don't really learn how to uh, handle trauma because uh, life on the planet is traumatic and it's overwhelming. So uh, when we don't have any training, the overwhelming permanently tips us over and we stay in samsara forever. But when doing the tantric vajrayana practices, uh, we actually um, learn how to deal with overwhelm in a totally different way. Once we've learned how to deal with with overwhelm in a totally new way, uh, without you know becoming PS, PTSD about it, or without uh, hurting others, then um, we're available for the Mahamudra and Dzogchen teachings, which is to to totally be present with whatever is happening, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I have contracts with some people that say, okay, I I just don't want to be overwhelmed. Period. So please be very safe. And then I have contracts with a couple of people. They're just saying, let it fly. Um, I really want to be a tantric student. So go ahead and overwhelm me. Um, and then I do. And then they complain. But that's OK. That's what I do. <laughs> because you can, I, it's all right. You, you, you know, that's kind of the progressive side of me. So if you're climbing the mountain and you know what you're doing and you're dedicated and you're doing it correctly, then yeah, you can kind of bitch your way up the mountain. 
I get it. You can say, this is kind of hard and I'm not really happy right now. And I go, well, yeah, of course, because um, you're doing the training. So yeah, you're on the trail. So of course your feet hurt and you know, you're know you cold and you're worried about frostbite and that's you know that's what happens, yeah. Um, so the, the hard part and the part that we uh, are trying to build uh, this Dharma Center is uh, very, very traditional and classical from the Tibetan point of view is that we're, we're trying to do everything. I mean, the, the incredible um, genius of uh, the Tibetans is they, they try to, they still do just like Dalai Lama and other great teachers like Dujan Rinpoche, you know, um, said, let's, we, we can practice all these different vehicles. We can coordinate it, you know, um, but uh, we, we have to have, uh, it, it takes some structure. And um, the structure is not just scriptural or ritual or um, scheduling. You know, it, it is very strong that way, but um, the, it, it also depends upon um, enlightened teachers. Right. So also what's I, I think it's totally classical and traditional. Um, so when uh, I don't want to just be the only teacher for Lions or you see. So whether some people see me as ordinary or see me as Buddha or anybody, uh, we want to have a, a group of teachers, which in a way is totally classical and traditional. So, you know, and the teachers that come here, they they get it that I get that. So uh, that's really important. But um, there, there's just going to be times where um, uh, we're not going to, we're going to feel a little overwhelmed. And then we can say, you know, right now this is, <laughs> this might be great. I'm going to, I'm going to step back. That's traditional. You say, you know, this is a little Lamala or Rimshay, this is a little rough. I'm just going to step back from this for a moment. You know, so there, there's ways of doing that without losing face or shame. You know, you're just saying, um, you know, um, but American style sometimes is you diss the teacher and diss the Dharma and diss your Sangha members, which is totally not cool, which nobody here does, of course. But it, so it's okay to just say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little bit overwhelmed. I, I need to cut back a little bit. And I'm always going to go, yeah, okay, got it. Like sometimes I tell people to cut back. But um, if people say, oh, okay, I want to be a tantric student, I really want to do it, um, then, you know, just tell me anything, then, then of course I will. And, um, you know, then inevitably, um, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to go like, oh, what did I ask for? <laughs> but even then, you can say, you know, I, 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 want to, um, I want to chill a little bit or something like that. But um, generally, however, we're we're always going to be overwhelmed if um, our meditation practice, our non-conceptual yogic practice, is not bigger than everything else we're doing. Period. 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 So um, the Dharma talks here and how I interact with people only make sense if you're actually doing a lot of sitting practice. If you're just reading or you're just, you know, a nice person or just helping out, uh, just a helper, that's great. But it, with, without the breadth and depth of um, the yogic practice, um, inevitably people are going to be a little bit tipped or just won't make sense. What are they talking about? You know, this is, I just, you know, so um, that, that part, uh, you know, we have to put out front and center that this is, um, we're, we teach all the different vehicles here, but primarily, uh, you know, Lama Chimpa is going to be teaching, you know, generally from uh, a Tantra point of view, which is going to not be um, okay for everybody, which is why, you know, I'm, I'm bringing in different teachers and training teachers here so we can have, saying, okay, this this person will meet you at this level. They're not going to, like, you know, do it. <laughs> Do a tantric trip on you or something. <laughs> something like that. So uh, you know, it's important to point out that um when we're working from uh, particularly from a Mahamudra Zokchen perspective, um, we're making the pledge to be present to what whatever's going on inside and outside. 
So this is simultaneously the safest and the scariest way to be. So the real practice is always going to be that middle way, the great middle way, we'd say the Maha Majjhimaka, that it's simultaneously the safest and the scariest place to be. So in a conversation with Bill, we had, we had an interesting encounter, Bill and I did uh, last week. Um, so there was like a violent episode on, on the street, you know? So I just went right into the center, just go right into it. So um, that's sometimes the safest, but also the scariest, but also the safest place to be. So from our point of view, as you know, if we take Tantrika point of view or even Madhumikan point of view, we go right to the center. We establish ourselves right in the center. Put yourself in the center of the mandala. Go, go right into the center. Bring it up close, you know, like that. So, um, so far I'm still alive. I've been shot at and I've been had guns held to me and at different Dharma centers, interestingly. Um, and I don't want that to happen here, but um, the, uh, by promoting a, a presence, uh, knowing that the world is uh, scary, um, actually it's the safest. Safest thing is to be awake, absolutely safest to be awake. It's not to be shut down or to have walls or plexiglass. Safest thing is always really have this 360 view and then, um, you know, you can be okay. But even the Buddha had, you know, had difficult things, right? <laughs> David Dato trying to trying to kill him and stuff like that, right? But because we're being present, the presence itself has um, uh, incredible power behind it. Yeah. Did do we do we get it so we can hear from Dirk? Uh, we can try. Can you hear me? Are you able to hear me now? They thought they fixed it, but I guess not. Yes, we still don't have it. It's time to move but you can just take some of the you can just run around. Well, now Lama's breaking up. <laughs> can you hear me? I don't want to just keep talking, but. I can't test it if I don't. Can you hear me now? No. How about now? No. And testing one, two, three. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's a good comment. Okay, yeah. I think there's, you know, like, um, um, uh, it's, it's really helped to try to learn someone else's language a little bit. Um, but, you know, just on a, on a, on a one-to-one -one basis, um, you know, not only is the matter of courtesy, but, you know, um, at least get familiarity with the different kind of thought structures, right? So, um, you know, when we travel the world, uh, we find uh, that most people uh, know more than one language, right? And it's kind of embarrassing, you know, since we're, you know, the American empire, you know, we figure, well, we don't need to learn anything else, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm a lazy language person myself, you know, so I know a little bit of Sanskrit, a little bit of Tibetan, a little bit of Spanish. Um, <clears throat> um, when I traveled to France, I found out that I was miserable. So I just 
<laughs> I was like, can say a save stuff like that. But uh, even the French, who I really like, actually appreciate if you just try, right? So um, you know, I, I think there's uh, there's something to appreciating how different language systems have evolved. But it really means like I'm appreciating what you're saying to me. I'm trying to meet you as a person, not not as a piece of information. So when we say learning someone's language, like learning where they're coming from, um, because you can be using the same words. Um, you know, people learn, people are training to be a therapist or a therapist. Now, people can be using the same words and you can be tricked into thinking you're meaning the same thing. So you have to explore their lives and find out, well, when you say that was difficult, tell me about how difficult it is. You know, what, you know, when you're saying that was traumatic, tell me how it is traumatic. You know, we're not just we're not just stopping at the definition. You have to fill it in with your world. With that. Mm. Yes. Well, I I think a lot about labels and and how how the label seems to be um, a sh shortcut or by the mind to not really understand or experience something. So if I say, um, uh, what are you going to do on Sunday? Well, I'll go to a Buddhist temple. That's not the reality of what my experience is going to be. It's just a way that I'm, I'm giving it to somebody or even giving it to myself. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I would like to get some like, um, how how we go beyond the label, how I expect you, know, you, you just say it will be we sit and meditate or nothing makes sense. But uh, I tell myself that many times it's just we 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 see the label like the figure inside the body to see what is in the mm -hmm. we just read the label and I'm happy with that. Superficial in some way. Yeah, I, uh, you know, we, we should generally have a follow up question when people say, How are you? And, and we should follow up with, Well, how much time do you have? So, I mean, you could use the word, You're going some days. Well, I'm going to this colorful room and I'm sitting around a bunch of people. And they go, Huh, you know, and then you can add more. Well, I'm you know, you can add all your internal states that are going on and you can add this and you don't even have to use the term temple or Buddhist or meditation. You would just be free flowing on what your actual lived experience was. So um, that's why we need to spend a lot of time meditating, which means we're listening to ourselves. We're, we're using less and less generic labels and more and more um, descriptive you know, we could call it descriptive labels until it comes to a point where um, we're, we're having uh, the subdirect experiences. And when we're having the sense of direct experiences, there's definitely a sense of mind has gone beyond mind. So uh, then we're in, in the world of, uh, you know, what we kind of label like uh, Mahamudra Dzogchen or sometimes you say and Zen don't know mind. We're having the direct experience and it's resonant and fulfilling, but uh, we can't just separate this is this and that's that because this experience is um, of experience of totality um, with, without everything being blurred together at the same time. So um, definitely, you know, when we're moving beyond labels, it's like having a fantastic meal, right? Where, where we're not just tasting the you know, the individual dishes, but the spices and the dishes are coming together in a total experience. So um, I hang out with this foodie person. <laughs> <laughs> never happened before. I know my family never talked about food. You just eat it and go away, go do some sport or something. <laughs> People go, yeah, I can really taste a little lemon in this. And you go, lemon? How did lemon get into... You know your muffin. I, you know, people say that. Do you know anybody that talks like that? I live with someone who talks like that. Yeah, it's like taste a little lemon and muffin. 
well, how did you, get, you know, so it's like that. So um, some people's experience is so subtle that even when they're using labels, they're realizing the labels are metaphors that pass, you know, that we're not holding them heavily. We're, we're using them as diving boards, right? And then language becomes useful. But mere labels tend to be like, you know, um, too sticky, right? And then you can't get rid of them. You know, you stick it on them like gum on your shoe. You know, so, but the more we do um, process meditation or non-conceptual meditation, then mm -hmm. we're going to, the, the gross labels fall away. And you don't, you know, if you're just sitting out looking at a tree, you wouldn't know you're looking at a tree anymore. You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know. So, um, a big part of uh, tantric practice is just looking at someone's face for a long time. People have done this, you know, usually it's a deity's face, but eventually someone's face you know or love. You know, people do that in, you know, workshops at Esalen, you know. Anybody been to Esalen, you know, do that? Yeah, you know, and uh, that's really weird to look at someone like for even five minutes, you know, without commenting, right? And then, then you extend it to more and more. And uh, suddenly, then you realize, I don't know that person at all. Right, even somebody that you've lived with, uh, right? you know, it's like you look at them and you look at them and you, you like you look in their eyes and then you realize that your labels are dissolving and, and you don't know who they are at all and they're totally fresh. So this completely fresh mind, you know, sometimes we call Rigpa like that. Like there's something happening, but you can't. Um, you're not going on an, any past reference at all. You know, something like that. Thank you. Yeah. What I found with labels is that if you, go, when I try to go beyond labels, I mean, you you will you ask for the felt frequently. Well, ask what's the felt experience, yeah. right? And I don't have vocabulary. <clears throat> like I get really, I'm lazy <laughs> in terms of my own language, mm -hmm. you know, which is a very rich language. I mean, English has got a huge vocabulary. And I don't, when I'm asked that, what's your felt experience? What are you feeling? I don't have language for it because I just don't know the words. So there's kind of this laziness that ends up just relying on labels and it's also it's like commonly uh, it's a way of of connecting right that that a label that i know and use is frequently a label that somebody else knows and uses and so we connect we understand labels can be very good for orientation you know so like you go to the orthopedist and say, well, where does it hurt? Well, it hurts in my right knee. So if I just said, um, I'm in pain, then the orthopedist would still have to say, like, you know, where? Because that that's be appropriate. But, um, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe now 30 years ago, when I was studying with Sasaki Roshi, like, yeah, that's Zen stick. You know, so go in and do three bows. And I thought, that's symbolic. But then one one time he um, really whacked me on the knee. You can't do that in America anymore. You'd be sued, you know. But he didn't care. He was like, you know. <laughs> and, he, and I was like, what was that? And I said, that's pain. And he said, no. So. Uh, went on. Sashin was like, this is an eight day or something. Until finally I did what? Oh! That's the real thing. Okay. Not only is it the real thing, but I'm expressing it. The real enlightenment is the expressions world. It's the show me world. It's not the information world. It's the show me world. But, you know, when we're dealing with problems, it does help to have information like, you know, like 
directions, right? You know, if somebody asks directions, we don't want to say, you know, you'll get there somehow, you know. So uh, we, we do need the labels, but as us um, undeveloped or partially developed um, beings, uh, you know, we, we really get stuck on labels. And, uh, you know, even if somebody, like in medical, if you come in groaning with pain, you know, they're, they're still going to say, where is it? You know, unless you, you come into the ER like, you know, then, that, then you'll get treatment right away, right? Heart attack. Yeah. So we, we want to see, we want to know the difference between the actual experience and the sign. But on the sign, signs and labels are important, but yeah, we, we generally camp out there. <laughs> so a big part of Tantra is learning learning this metaphorical poetic inner language. Um, uh, so, and transitioning out of literalist language to metaphoric creative language. So we can't just say we're going to create, uh, we're going to move out of literalist language to creative language without actually practicing the creative language. So to practice the creative language, you actually have to like listen to poetry, write poetry, do some painting, do some dancing, you know, do some photography, do you know, uh, do some crafts, something like that. You have you can't just say, well, now I'm going to think um, creatively, or I'm going to use creative style poetic language and not actually do it. You actually then have to do it. So when we're visualizing, um, you know. Tantra is big on new age stuff, like here's the chakras and and all that, you know, tankas and paintings and internet and the winds and channels and all that. Just that that's just kind of like um, going to the museum and looking at someone else's painting. You know, we eventually have to come up with our own expression of of what our Vajra world looks like. This is very progressive for me to say this. So because somebody might, so you read, maybe I, I don't want to go too far down a rabbit hole, but you know, you, you various tantras, which I'm all familiar with. Yes, I know them. And they'll say, well, this, the central channel is, you know, like a thumb. Why does a thumb in some practices? Well, that sounds really good, except everyone's thumb is different. <laughs> so don't take that too literally, right? You know, and then people go, okay, well, if it's not a thumb, you know, then, uh, you know, could we could we say it in, um, you know, centimeters? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was missing the point. It's kind of like the width of your thumb. It's kind of like that. Kind of should be the, it's kind of like that. Yours might be like, you know, uh, you know, bigger width, but it's still whatever our individual experience is. Whenever we say the word, um, we should say, it, "Well, it's kind of like a channel, right? It's kind of wide, or it's kind of thin, or it's kind of blue, or it's kind of pink, or something." But then it's it's too cumbersome to say that. You know, you'd have all these. The tantras and the experiential texts would all be three times longer because they'd have to say, you know, it it kind of has you know this many spokes. It it kind of goes around to the tip of your forehead, and you go, well, does it? You know, then there are people because I have this like, you know, I've been in groups where like, Kyle Shea and some teachers like are on like cancer rooms should go into extreme detail, and then you know then people are asking questions. They go, well, does it? Does it stop at your eyebrows? And does it is it one centimeter up? Or what if you, you know, Rimshi, what if you have really wide eyebrows or and <laughs> you know, and then it goes with the Vinaya thing too. And then like people are like when I was doing a lot of empowerments in the Bay Area with Kala Rimshi and other teachers, you know, people would it was great. People would ask all these wild questions about sexual energy in Tantra. And eventually, like, Kalarimshe is talking to Choki Nima or uh, Richard Barron, and finally they're going, I'm just going to let people do what they want to do. Just, 
you know, like, don't get lost and, you know, so like that. <laughs> yeah, we have time for one more um, question then we need to end or complaint or comment. Yay. Who's here for the first time? Thanks for coming, Heather. <laughs> it's like, sorry to call you out by name, sorry. To... Yeah, so, because usually Dharma talks, we like to hear like, just be more patient and, you know, kind of, we're getting a little bit technical, right? You know, getting into it like that. But um, <clears throat> the, the, the books we should be reading should be good on-ramps and stuff like that to give general information, right? That's scholarship is really important, um, you know, to get general information and terms and stuff like that. And there are tons of good books, you know, from Dalai Lama to Pema Chodron to, you know, Tukton Jimpa to Tukton Chodron, like plenty good. When you, when you have a lineage teacher, you, you want things to be specific. You, you know, you want to just, you know, you know, get the specifics down, then it's useful. Okay. We're gonna have lunch after this, so we do have food, right? Yeah, and then and we'll get to do, should we do announcements before we do prayers? Do we have announcements? Okay, uh-oh. Maybe people can help me by miss something i like short announcements okay so um so the announcement i have is that uh next sunday um like uh, lama said jen is going to give a talk on the heart suture and then after her talk we're going to have a graduation ceremony not ceremony celebration what am i saying <laughs> celebration for a, a couple of sangha members um eli and jules and then on the 25th we're going to celebrate lama's birthday here and I know that I said it's short, but I have to also mention on July 7th at the Dante Club, we're going to have a celebration for Lama Lai again with Clemon. It says we do expressions once a month, and we're going to do it at the Dante Club on July 7th. So those are my announcements. Okay. And Susan has an announcement. Oh. Okay. I did it. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so we'll do dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel of Bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful chan music, tens and gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushu, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Usang Jakpa, I make requests at your holy feet.
Oh, my. 